Thank you. Okay. So, uh, good evening. Um, after that lovely uh, introduction, I don't have to say very much about myself. I am the curator of herpetology. Herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. By the way, if you find that I'm talking too loud, raise a hand. If you find that I'm talking too quiet, raise a hand. And I'll ask you what's going on. Anyway, so uh, herpetology, yes, the study of reptiles and amphibians. Um, uh, an interesting branch of vertebrate zoology. And my work uh, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years has been um, all focused on, or almost all focused on, reptiles and amphibians of Madagascar. And I became very interested during my PhD, very particularly in the extremely small uh, reptiles and amphibians, where Madagascar, as I'll explain, is um, a true uh, leader. So first, let's give it a little bit of context. Uh, Madagascar is um, a truly vast island. It sits um, 400 kilometers, 400, 500 kilometers off the east coast of Mozambique. Um, it is about 1,500 kilometers from north tip to south tip, uh, 1,000 kilometers wide. So that makes it roughly the size of Germany or France, uh, three times the size of the UK or one's American, about the size of California. It is a gigantic island, uh, as I'll get to in a minute, calling it an island is perhaps a stretch of the imagination or the definition of island. But this story is also quite personal to me because when I was very young, maybe six or seven years old, I fell in love with the island and the idea of Madagascar. I suppose I read about it in a book or saw it on a, on a television program or something. Uh, but from that point onward, I had a singular focus trying to get to Madagascar, and um, my poor parents and teachers in school had to deal um, with that uh, focus and interest. Um, eventually, my father relented, and he uh, took me on a trip to Madagascar in 2005, my first time, and since then, I've been back numerous times uh, doing research of, let's say, increasing sincerity. Um, I have been over much of the island, and, uh, and see many of its delightful creatures. It happens that Madagascar is a good place to be interested in and fall in love with if you are generally interested in evolutionary biology because the island has often been called a naturalist's paradise. Um, what does it mean to be a naturalist's paradise? Well, uh, the diversity of the island is truly immense, and it's the island itself is so big and is, uh, for many reasons that I'll explain in a second, so convenient to study that we even call it a model region uh, to understand species diversification. So first of all, I've already said it's a gigantic island. Um, it is geologically very heterogeneous and uh, topographically heterogeneous. So we have a mountain chain that runs roughly from the southeast to the north. Uh, bends up at the top there. So you have a very stark mountain chain that runs from south to north. Then, of course, its position in the Indian Ocean causes the prevailing winds to dump all of the moisture that they have along that mountain chain, resulting in a very humid zone along the east coast that's very steep, and then a slow decline from east to west on the other side of that plateau, uh, that is sort of subhumid, going into dry. We have subarid practical deserts in the south of the island. And then across various different parts, there are these montane zones that are a world unto themselves. And so because of the convenient north-south axis and of, of, uh, of the island, as well as the east-west axis of these um, climatological factors, we wind up with these relatively simple axes along which to analyze things. And that produces a variety of habitats, ranging from incredibly lush rainforests to the extremely arid south and southwest of the island. We have bizarre structures called tsingi. This is a limestone karst. And these are incredible for generating species, which is a topic of another talk at some point. 
But one thing we really don't have in Madagascar are things like this. Mm -hmm. This is your typical African scene. And Madagascar sits awfully close to Africa, so we might think uh, that we should expect something vaguely African. But in fact, we have a typically Asiatic flavor to the reptiles and amphibians and other fauna and flora of Madagascar. And why is that? Well, uh, let's start on a journey through Earth's history. This is Gondwana. Madagascar is sitting there, gently squashed between India and Africa. Uh, it might surprise you to see India there, but yes, India is originally a southern continent that, that wandered north. So we start off 220 million years ago. At this point, uh, there are um, prolific dinosaurs all over the place, and we have uh, bird dinosaurs all over the place. Um, and yeah, Madagascar is sitting nicely in the center there, above sea level, so completely exposed. As we move forward in time, we get to 160 million years ago, things are already starting to go wrong between Africa and Madagascar, they've decided to part ways. And so by 120 million years ago, we have this continent that we call India Gaspar, very cleverly named, um, with just India and Madagascar attached to one another, separated from Africa. And then uh, India and Madagascar themselves go separate ways, and what follows is a period of incredibly rapid movement, where India zooms north, crushes the uh, Indo-Tethys, where whales are kind of evolving in here at that time, uh, leaving Madagascar behind from around 95, 96 million years ago. So we have this very large continental landmass left behind, isolated, in roughly the same position that it is today um, as uh, at following this separation. And what that means is that by 90 million years ago, we're isolated. And at 65 million years ago, oh, so 80 million years ago, things continue north. And 65 million years ago, there was this big event uh, where a rather large rock smacked into Mexico. That means that Madagascar was already isolated at the time of the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. Which meant that practically everything that was on it until that time, which included presumably still dinosaurs and all of the typical Gondwana fauna, was wiped clean. And we have a clean, isolated slate that was subsequently recolonized uh, by various different creatures. Now you can see there's a period before India makes it into Asia where India is sitting quite conveniently close to Madagascar getting further and further away all the time, but there is this kind of period where India is there, and presumably there are land masses in between. And so these, these connections create an opportunity for colonization of Madagascar from places. So it could have come across from Africa, or they could have come across from Asia. So when you reconstruct the uh, origins of the fauna, or the closest relatives of the fauna um, that is present on Madagascar, what you wind up with, this graph is somewhat confusing, you have to read it from right to left, but you wind up with um, the very oldest lineages are kind of Gondwanan in origin, their closest relatives are in South America. If we go closer, and especially looking after the, the KPG extinction, we wind up with the vast majority of species either coming from, uh, from Asia here, those are the, the green things, have Asian origins, and the blue things, the most recent colonists, are indeed coming from Africa. So what that means is most of the animals, and uh, well, most of the animals that live in Madagascar got there uh, rapidly. So what we are left with uh, after, after they wrapped it, presumably to this relatively depauperate um, area, they found a habitat that could, was right to be colonized and an enormous landmass over which to do it. And so they diversified enormously. And today, the diversity in Madagascar is, of course, extremely unique. We have something like 95% endemism of all vertebrates. Lower in some groups like birds, of course, uh, but very, very high in other groups. Now, if one hears about Madagascar, one perhaps always imagines uh, these chaps here. Uh, lemurs are, of course, the best known uh, uh, representatives of Madagascar, and deservedly so, because they are a very diverse group, and uh, obviously also very cuddly. 
But what the island arguably should be known for is its reptiles and amphibians, because compared to all other land masses in the world, Madagascar truly has unparalleled levels of diversity and endemism. So the island of Madagascar creates, it represents 0.4% of the world's terrestrial surface area, so above sea level. But it contains 4% of all reptile species and 4% of all amphibian species. So I don't know how many uh, species of reptiles and amphibians there actually are in Denmark. Uh, I think it's probably in total about 12 or 13. Uh, Madagascar, we have 376 frog species. Uh, it will be 318 next week, I think. Um, and we have um, over 400 species of reptiles. This all in a, in a country about the size of Germany. So not only do we have extremely high levels of diversity, but we also have uh, so species richness. But that species richness is not just equally distributed across the mountain, but it's of course located particularly in those very humid zones, in the rainforests, which are anyway known for high diversity, um, uh, but in reptiles especially also in, in very dry areas. And then we have this incredible pattern of local endemism. So most species are highly localized, only found in very small places. When we uh, look at those groups, there are some really fascinating representatives. Madagascar has over half of all the chameleons in the world. We think that chameleons may even have originated on the island, although the jury is still out on that question. We have an amazing diversity of geckos. The island has been colonized, I think, seven times by different radiations of geckos, which have done all kinds of weird and strange things, like um, evolved to look very much like bamboo or other tree barks. We have an entire radiation of endemic snakes, about 100 species of snakes that are found nowhere else in the world that have colonized a huge variety of different niches from uh, water snakes to vine snakes to snakes that specialize on eating frogs and snakes with hinged teeth for eating hard body lizards. Very, very cool um, uh, and, and fascinating radiation there. And the frogs, we have a beautiful diversity, including um, species that look like our typical hyla tree frogs that we even have in Denmark, but completely unrelated to them, convergently evolved on the tree, far, tree frog uh, ecomorph. But this radiation, the Mantellidae, is just one of four radiations that have colonized Madagascar. Now, colonized, I say, highlight very importantly because amphibians are extremely intolerant to saline environments. So these things have colonized Madagascar across the ocean, which we thought for a long time quite improbable. Um, but it turns out when you give evolution enough time, anything that's improbable does tend to sometimes happen. So on the one hand, we have the, the Mantellidae, and on the other hand, we have some very weird frogs in the microhylidae. The microhylid frogs are the ones that I particularly specialize on. Uh, they don't all look quite as strange as this chap, which is from the free to pseudo. So obviously, um, we have this great diversity of things. And kind of traditionally, we did know that there was a lot going on. But in 2009, my colleagues uh, put together a, the first DNA barcoding um, a database that brought together not only all of the described species to date, but all of the genetic samples that they had collected from species that turned out to be just as genetically distinct or more genetically distinct than things that were already described, and therefore get an indication of how much undescribed diversity there was. At that time, in 2009, we had 250 species described. So this paper showed we have at least, or, or we barely had, with 250 species, barely had half of all species described. Since that paper was uh, published, we have, well now we have 300, almost 318 species, so we have 130 species described uh, by my colleagues and me in the last uh, 12, 13 years. So it's a, a pretty high taxonomic rate for birds. Okay? Um, so, so why, why is it so possible to do so much taxonomy? Why has the taxonomy kind of been underestimated in this group? Well, a lot of it has to do with how difficult it is to actually collect some of the species, and in particular those species that I'll talk about now. 
So this is a very small frog. I think you can all see it very clearly, yes. Um, if not, there, there is. There's his eye. That's his nostrils there. And there's a, a finger. There are four fingers on that hand. Um, so the, there, there is an enormous diversity of reptiles and amphibians in rainforests that have colonized the leaf litter. Leaf litter provides a unique habitat because it is structurally very complex. It is uh, extremely humid. You have all kinds of detritivores, which are themselves quite delicious if you're this small. And perhaps by being this small, you can also escape predation. So that's part of the reason we think the species have mineralized. And in Madagascar, we have a remarkable diversity of very, very small frogs um, and, and, and other and small reptiles, which we'll get to in a second. And often these things are unseen. In fact, for the longest time, um, we, we knew practically nothing about them. But actually, they are very frequently heard. Anytime you go to a rainforest in Madagascar, you will hear something a little bit like this. Yours, do you know which species it is? <laughs> so Yours is a student of mine. He's working on uh, these frogs. This is a Stumphia maledicta in this case, I think. So um, the sounds of tiny frogs completely dominate, the, well, the sound of frogs in general, completely dominate the soundscape of practically any forest in Madagascar. They actually out sound, out way, out call, the insects. So you typically are being surrounded by the sound that to the uninitiated might sound like insect calls, but are in fact uh, thousands of tiny frogs calling to try to get mates to come to you. Uh, these are indeed very small. This is one of the rather, uh, well, medium-sized ones. That's about um, I'd say 11 or 12 millimeters, maybe down to 8 millimeters. So in this habitat, not only do we have frogs, which are much louder than they are large, but we also have silent creatures. The chameleons, these leaf chameleons in the genus Burkisio, have called the leaf litter habitat home, and you may be familiar with the fact that some chameleons give something like this big, uh, these chaps can very happily sit on the tip of your thumb. So this raises all kinds of really interesting questions. Why are these things uh, evolving to be so small? How many of them are there? And how uh, do we study these extremely small organisms? Um, in order to tell you a little bit about that story, I'll take you on a journey of what it's like to go to Madagascar and do the work that we do in the field there. Every trip to Madagascar starts here. This is Antananarivo, the capital city. We come here usually for a week or two to try to get the permits that we had already arranged would be there by the time we arrived. It's a little bit longer. Um, we get all the equipment set up, we get in our vehicles, and we leave the city in search of forest. You travel by road, usually in a 4x4. Four four, and initially, the roads are beautifully paved, paved by money, paved, well, money from beer and milk, or the beer, beer and dairy are the two things that have paved most of the roads in Madagascar. Um, when you get to the places where the beer deliveries are not so frequent, the roads are not quite as good. And as you get further and further, uh, things tend to deteriorate to the point where even the 4x4 can't go any further. And so the oxen get involved. But actually, about 20 minutes after this picture was taken, the oxen themselves were defeated. So it's not super easy to get to the rainforest, which is all the way over there on that mountain. Um, and a good deal of it has to be done on foot. Now, much of that journey on foot to get to the rainforest uh, actually goes to the habitat that looks a little bit like this, because Madagascar has suffered intense deforestation over the last, especially the last uh, 100 years. Um, it's not as bad as some of the early publications made out. So some people have claimed that 90% of 95% of all Madagascar's rainforest is gone because they assume the whole island was covered in rainforest or forests, which is simply not true. But certainly 
within the last um, uh, few decades, we have lost a huge percentage of the forest in Madagascar. So it does take some time until you get to an area that looks a little bit more like this. Once here, we set up a field camp, often uh, quite rushed, as this one is, and we immediately start our surveys. Uh, for those who don't know, surveying for reptiles and amphibians takes place almost exclusively at night, or not almost exclusively, but in large part at night, um, by aid of head torches. Why at night? Well, most geckos are active at night, most snakes are active at night, and things that aren't active often sleep in relatively exposed places, where if a snake is trying to come out and get them, or if a small um, uh, mouse lemur or something is on their way to try and eat them, they can fall to the floor. And they reflect torchlight. And so it's relatively easy. So during the day, finding a chameleon is uh, rather difficult. But um, when it's nighttime and you've got a head torch on, you can often spot dozens of them in a relatively short time because of that fact that their skin is reflective while they're sleeping. So we do a lot of our work at night, and of course, always accompanied by uh, fantastic um, students and colleagues from Madagascar universities. But we also do some slightly different sampling methods, so we use slightly more passive methods. This is a, a pitfall trap with a drift line, so anything slithering or crawling through the forest floor here hits the trap, hits the, the, the drift fence, moves along it, and falls into that bucket there. Um, this allows us to find a lot of the fossorial uh, or semi-fossorial skinks, for instance, that live in that leaf litter that we wouldn't otherwise encounter on a normal day to day. My personal favorite method, though, is this one. We uh, go and find a promising looking area of leaf litter and very quickly scoop all of it into a rice bag. And then we spend some very happy hours combing through leaf by leaf that leaf litter in order to try to find any little uh, reptiles or amphibians or other exciting creatures that are living in there. Uh, avoiding, of course, all of the scorpions and other unpleasantness. Um, so this is a very promising way to find uh, some of the smaller things that are very hard to find. But the real secret is uh, this guy. This is Angelouk um fantastic guide. He's been working as a field guide in northern Madagascar for, I think, about 30 years. Uh, and his father was a guide before him. And his real speciality is finding the animals that are extremely hard to find. And in particular, he's a specialist at finding all the He's a particular specialist at finding um, very, very small chameleons. So this here is Brookesia tuberculata. Uh, again, you can sit very happily on the tip of your thumb. I think the adults are two and a half or three uh, centimeters long. Uh, here we have another picture of a Brookesia. Um, there he is. There's his eye and there's the rest of his body um, in that deep, deep and dense leaf litter. Fortunately, these tiny chameleons, they also reflect torchlight, just like the larger chameleons, so we can use those typical methods for, for finding them. And here, okay, this one's given away by the picture of the, of the finger, um, but the, the frogs are uh, likewise very small and very, very hard to find, so it takes some um, experience to try and find them. And given that fact, it's actually remarkable that how early some of the work on these organisms started. So, I'll talk first about uh, our research on frogs and well, frogs in general, and then I'll go on to talk about the, um, the reptile side of the story, or the chameleon side of the story. So the work on, uh, on Stumphia in particular, or, or on these tiny frogs in particular, um, began with uh, this little frog from the island of Nosy Bay off the coast of Madagascar, north coast of Madagascar, uh, described by the German Oskar Böttger, and um, obviously described in Latin, and he uh, named the species Stumphia after Antonio Stumpf, who originally sent him um, the specimens, and uh, gave it the name Stumphia solidus, smooth tongue, uh, for reasons that are not all clear. And what was interesting is he was completely baffled as to which group of Stumphia. Uh, solidus should, should belong. He even said maybe it's a little bit like. Uh, Dendrobal baites, which are the South American dart frogs, because you can like you can vaguely see a similarity if you squint 
Um, in any case, it wasn't clear for another 40 years which group of uh, frogs these actually belonged to um, until it was finally realized that ah, these are microhylid frogs. Microhylidae is a family of frogs found uh, across the tropics. In fact, there are some species in North America. Regrettably, the only continent that doesn't have any is Europe. Um, which makes me very upset. But anyway, so we have um, these microhylid frogs, very diverse radiation in Madagascar, and here in 1881, the first species is being described. Following that, numerous additional species would slowly be added, but in fact, basically every small frog that anyone was finding in Madagascar was kind of being lumped into stone feeding. Kind of just assume, oh, there's only one radiation of very small microhydrate frogs in Madagascar, and that's, that's that. It was very small. Um, but in 2008, Katharina Wollenberg and colleagues um, produced this paper looking at the diversification of, uh, of the subfamily of frogs that's only found in Madagascar in particular. And what they found stumped them a little bit because we have up here, Sumphia. And then we have this chap here, who's supposed to be some here, but he's not in the right place on this tree. You know, we evolutionary trees, presume you do. And then, in particular, we have this clay down here, which is definitely not where they're supposed to be, if they're supposed to be up here. And these ones here are found in the south of Madagascar, down here. Uh, this guy is found in the center of Madagascar, roughly there. And then these ones are found basically everywhere else, actually quite widespread across the island. So we have this strange pattern emerging here, um, but the tree wasn't very well resolved, so we weren't really sure what was going on. So in 2016, my colleagues and I revisited this story and produced a much more comprehensive phylogenetic tree, and we were looking particularly at this chap here. And what we found is that not only does he, uh, is it genetically truly uh, separate, but actually morphologically, especially in the skeleton, um, there are several key features that separate it from Stumphia. And so for the first time, we were really sure that there are more genera of miniaturized frogs in Madagascar than we had thought before. So we named this Anilani. Anilani is Malagasy, it means on the side of or beside, because it sits on the side of Stumphia and Um but also in this paper, we revisited those other miniaturized lineages and, and found more. And um, so here is generally a, a general overview of some of those species. So this is a Stumphia, but then we have these three chaps here who each belong to different lineages, and that doesn't seem to add up. And so in 2019, my colleagues and I uh, addressed specifically the taxonomy of these different things, looking at them in comparison to their genetic closest relatives to try and figure out what was going on. And what we found was that this species here is an anodontyla. Those are usually arboreal frogs that are substantially larger. This, uh, this frog is, I think, uh, 9 or 10 millimeters long um, as an adult. We have this species here, to come back to that in a second. We have this one here, who is uh, from it's, it's a species of rhomophorine. Rhomophorine are typically much larger frogs. Uh, that weird shaped burrowing frog we saw earlier, that's also a rhomophorine. You can see he's sort of vaguely rhomophorine shaped, but in kind of a compressed size. And then these, these chaps here are very interesting. We found that there are three different lineages, closely related, well, closely, quite substantially distantly related from one another, enough that they are decidedly um, three separate species, they also have different calls and, and different morphology. And interestingly, there were no available names. They had never been described as species because we were so confused as to where they would sit in the phylogeny. They hadn't been discovered until relatively recently because the forests that they came from hadn't been surveyed in the early days. And so we had the unique and rare opportunity to name three species in a new genus. And um, being a fan of wordplay, I decided that it would probably be best if we named the genus Mini, and we call the three species Minimum, Minuscule, and Miniature. So we did. 
And so uh, we named these three species, Minimum and Miniature and Miniscule, all from southern Madagascar. Um, and then we have these other lineages, Anadonchi, like Eximia and Rhombophrene proportionalis. So by exploring these different lineages, we were able to reveal that these miniaturized frogs had been taxonomically severely underestimated, um, resulting in two new genera with Anilani and Mini, and also that there had been multiple independent in instances of miniaturization, of extreme miniaturization. We have extreme miniaturization in Stumphia, in Romafri, not so much in Anilani, they're a little bit bigger, but in Mini and in Anadon Hyla. So when you start looking at those individuals uh, separately, or if you, start, if you start comparing the skeletons of those individuals, what we find out is that those three major lineages that have produced extremely small species have resulted in such extremely similar uh, skeletons that if we didn't have the genetic data to understand and contextualize it, we would definitely still think that these are all the same genus. Um, and that is the result of extreme skeletal convergence, um, possibly brought about by um, pedomorphism. So these, these frogs are essentially pedomorphic, which means that they look a lot like very young frogs, froglets of other larger species. And uh, that results in a rather pedomorphic skull with highly ossified um, uh, otic capsules where the ears are kept and a um, anteriorly shifted jaw. But in this one other case with the rhombophrene, you'll notice it's, active, it's, it's missing here, but that rhombophrene is actually miniaturized in a different way. So whereas pedomorphism creates a phenotype that looks a lot more like a juvenile frog, um, rhombophrene proportionalis, as we called it, seems to have undergone a process that's more akin to proportional morphism. That is, essentially, you take a, the proportions of a larger frog and you simply shrink them all at the same time. If we look at the evolutionary history of, uh, of these frogs and we plot their body size on it, with blue being extremely small and red being extremely large, uh, we see this pattern that there are Stumphia, which is a generally very small lineage, together with Anilani down here. They represent potentially one instance of overall miniaturization with several independent lineages that have gotten much smaller than the average back here. We have Rhombophrene proportionalis sitting here on a branch that doesn't connect with this Stumphia thing, a bit confusing here. We have Anamontyla eximia doing its very weird thing up there. And then we have Mini all the way up here doing its own thing in South Madagascar. And in the, um, these, these red lineages are quite interesting because, in particular, Plethodontohyla inguinalis, that red species there, is the largest microhylid in the world. And sister to this genus that contains the largest microhylid is uh, Mini Mung and the other two species of Mini which are among the smallest vertebrates in the world. So we have a surprising repetition within a single radiation on a single island in Madagascar, um, which has brought about repeated convergence in both morphology and ecology. So not only are these things all very small and similar looking, but they also all occupy more or less the same niche. They all live in leaf litter. So this is fascinating in its own right, but it also allows us to take a larger perspective and look at other systems. So recently I started collaborating um, with colleagues who work on Southeast Asian frogs, and we found very similar patterns in Southeast Asian frogs with some radiations having repeatedly undergone miniaturization in uh, separate contexts in Southeast Asia. So miniaturization is a very common theme in various groups of frogs, especially in the tropics. And there are also a huge wealth of species to be described, both in Madagascar and elsewhere. In a single monograph, we described 26 new species of these because they have been basically overlooked until now or were very difficult to sample. If we move on now to the chameleon side of the story, Interestingly, it starts again with Oscar Bitka. He described this species, Rakesia minima, 
very, very small species that occurs on the same small island of Nossi Bay as uh, Stumphia soliglossa. You notice this description is written in German and is slightly more detailed than the description of Stumphia. In any case, this was the start of work on the very, very small chameleons, which are today in uh, uh, their in the genus Burkizia, but we recently revalidated the subgenus Evoluticauda um, to refer specifically to this one radiation of extremely small um, leaf chameleons. The taxonomic work on these was very slow to start. It began uh, in, I think, 1886 or 1887 with Perkesia, uh, or 1890, no, 1893, that must be, um, with Perkesia minima, and then there were two more species described in 1900, and then a long gap where basically no additional species were being described. And from 1970 onward, uh, the discoveries intensified. And the reason for that is because people started doing, the scientists themselves started doing fieldwork and started to actually go and look for these small <laughs> chameleons in places that hadn't been visited before and in, uh, at an intensity that hadn't been done before. And in um, the discovery of very, very small reptiles for some reason totally catches the media's attention. It might be because of the pictures that look a little bit like this. Um, but in 2012, uh, Frank Glav, one of my PhD advisors and colleagues, described four new species of chameleon, um, of, of Burkesia evoluticola, from northern Madagascar, basically all of which are quite threatened, and the smallest of which, Burkesia micra, was at that time potentially uh, the smallest or one of the smallest uh, amniovertebrates of all time. We ourselves are also having a birth birth. Um, However, that was not the end of the tale. For last year, we described this chap. Now, we had used micro, so we had to go one scale down. So we described Rokizia nana. Uh, this species has the smallest male, probably, of any amniovertebrate. It's 13.5 uh, millimeters from nose to the base of the tail. Um, and here you can see it's just an incredibly, incredibly small animal. The female is a little bit larger, and we get into a fight here because the people who work on geckos in Central America uh, and, and in the Caribbean really want to have the smallest vertebrate as well. So there is a bit of a competition between Spherodactylus geckos and Perkesia chameleons for the title of world's smallest uh, amnio. But in any case, uh, for now, at least the title of smallest adult male uh, probably currently belongs to Perkesia nana. This study, or this series of studies, revealed uh, not only a surprising diversity of very, very small chameleons in the forests of Madagascar, but also something about their biogeography. Specifically, almost all of the species of Evoluticauda that we've described to date are from single mountain peaks or relatively high elevation on single mountains. And most of them have very small uh, uh, distribution ranges. Exception being uh, uh, the species here, which is uh, Burkesia periurazi, which is found at much lower elevation, seems to have a, a wider distribution. And, uh, and, and Karki, which is a larger species, potentially has a little bit better uh, distribution ability. But in any case, most species are endemics on single mountain places or single individual areas. So it seems that mountains, as well as islands, in the case of Rukesia minima and Rukesia micra, uh, yes, Rukesia micra, uh, are generating species in a way that kind of complies with our preconceptions of how species are generated in systems like the other really interesting outcome, and the reason that the press particularly glommed on to this paper, was that um, they are relatively well endowed. And in particular, uh, Burkesia micra has, uh, Burkesia nana, sorry, uh, has perhaps the largest genitals relative to body size of, uh, of 
maybe a vertebrate, um, and certainly Rickesia tuberculata, that's that point up there, has a, a obscenely large um, relative genital size compared to its body size. Why that's the case is not entirely clear. It may be that um, the males are getting smaller and smaller and the females are staying a certain size, and so the male copulatory organ still has to basically fit in the larger female, and so that bit is constrained in how small it can get while the rest of the body can just shrink and shrink and shrink. Not a very good relationship. Uh, bear in mind that genitals in chameleons are basically everted, so they, they, they come out as a sack. So you can store quite a long tube on the inside of the body uh, if it's kind of folded up nicely. So you can, you can kind of fit things. And um, not just that, but from a taxonomic perspective, what's quite interesting to us is uh, the ornamentation on the genitals. So here you have the spines. In fact, these spines are pretty mean. They're really uh, hard and, and, and very sharp uh, spines on the end of there. Here we have some gentle, soft lobes. So there's a lot of variation in terms of the ornamentation, and that tells us a little bit about sexual selection in these, in these animals. There's still some kind of sexual competition going on. So everything that we've learned, both from the tiny frogs and the tiny chameleons, is really just opening more questions. More questions about why are their genitals so much larger than they should be, both their body sizes. And questions about how on earth does an animal that can sit on the tip of my thumb, pump with a ballistic tongue, and have the visual acuity to be able to see its prey at, or I mean, it's very close to it, but it's still a, a, a visual feat in low light in the, uh, on the rainforest floor. Um, how do you fit a vertebrate brain, similar in almost all aspects, to our own, into a head that can sit on the top of a needle? And questions like that, I mean, they're really almost endless. Um, but they don't stop, of course, with the systems that I've talked about. I can go on to talk about also the extremely small geckos that we have in Madagascar and other places, and the frogs and salamanders and all kinds of other fascinating creatures. And that is one of the reasons that I think miniaturization as a phenomenon and as, a, as various different study systems um, is particularly eye-opening and interesting. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk by thanking you all for listening. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you've got. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I think we all enjoyed it very much. So let's see if anybody has any questions. Fascinating. What's the lifespan of these? That's a very good question. <laughs> no idea. So chameleons are notorious for having lifespans that are very short. Most chameleons live in the fast lane, which is quite surprising given what they look like and how they move. Um, they, there are species of chameleons that have lifespans of just a single year, um, where all of the population dies, or basically all the population dies in the dry season. They survive as eggs and hatch out again. Um, those are probably not the life histories of our tiny species. But still, I would be surprised if the smallest species are living longer than five or six years, uh, even in captivity when you take really good care of them. So, of course, every lifespan is shorter in the wild, right? <laughs> because there are predators and things. Um, with the frogs, I don't think anyone has ever tried to look. It's not that difficult to assess, actually, if you have the right methods. You just have to look for, uh, well, I'm not sure that they form nice rings, but they should form nice rings of classification uh, in their bones. So you should actually be able to see, um, basically calculate how old they are. I would be surprised if the small frogs are living longer than five or six years. Uh, but still, that's a substantial lifetime for such a small animal. Is that comparable to, say, frogs in Denmark? Or? Um, our frogs probably live substantially longer, uh, unless the cats get to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the trouble in, um, well, you have to also account for the fact that the metabolism of anything that is ectothermic in the tropics is going to be an order of magnitude faster than anything that's in our cold environments here. Even on a hot day, we're still 
okay, on a hot day we're at the same temperature as they are kind of in the dry season. So in the wet season it gets even warmer and we're talking about, you know, perhaps in the leaf litter it's different. Maybe it is a little bit cooler in the leaf litter and, um, and they're able to kind of regulate and keep things a little bit slower than they otherwise might be. Um, but I would imagine that the temperature and the humidity are making a big difference in how quickly they live their sort of life cycles. We know from other larger frogs in Madagascar that they sometimes can get 15, 16 years old. Um, but that would be really remarkable if it goes into the very, very small things. I think that's unlikely. Something like uh, dispersal, I guess many of these creatures yes. are extremely slow. What about the tadpoles from the frogs? Are they, uh, is that one of the purposes of having tadpoles so, so far? You would think, yeah. but I think actually it's almost the opposite. So the very fact that these frogs, some here, have non-feeding tadpoles <coughs> that don't enter the water column. They live either in foam nests or jelly nests, and although they hatch out of their eggs, they never eat. Um, and they never swim anywhere because they're just in this comfy little cozy nest until they develop their legs and walk about. And the, the smallest um, froglet ever collected is, I think, 1.3 millimeters long and uh, a fully formed froglet, obscenely small vertebrate, right? Um, and uh, it's got a brain and a blood system and a heart. It's uh, incredible. But to your question, I think um, dispersal is probably the, the very fact that they are, uh, they, their tadpoles aren't going anywhere, and they don't, for the most part, jump. They, they can if they need to, but these actually are walking frogs, and that's a consistent factor in basically all of the world's miniaturized frogs. They all walk, which means they have slightly weird limb proportions, and they are going places much slower than they otherwise might be. And I think that explains quite well, or feeds quite well, into the very reason that they are so diverse. Because if they colonize an area, they're not likely to go back. You know, you, you've got this, yeah, you don't have dispersal from population A to population B. If the population grows over those areas and something interrupts it, they're not likely to reconnect anytime soon or at any high rate. And so you do have these very, very high rates of species. We have 46 species of described structure at the moment. There are uh, several along the way. But it's um, a, a remarkably diverse radiation. But there was a few that were more widespread. Yes, there ones, but some in the lowlands. Exactly. So maybe yeah. they are old or whatever. Um, well, mostly I think the lowlands pr present less, fewer barriers to dispersal in general than mountain gullies. And the, the water is moving slower. They, <laughs> they suck at swimming. So the, the a river would not be a, would, would be a substantial barrier to them under any circumstance. Um, but still, they're kind of able, especially I imagine in drought, when they have our opportunity to cover uh, to cross some of those rivers, you're more likely to have a larger distribution area at low elevation than you are at high elevation. Especially because, and I've written a, a few papers about this, when you have mountain peaks, um, and you have a population on this mountain and a population on this mountain, if the population is to disperse from this one to this one, that can only happen at the highest altitude it can happen at is the altitude of connection between them. So if there is a valley, a, a valley in between them, you have to be able to tolerate the very warm temperatures at lower elevation in order to get around that valley and get up. And so you wind up with being able to essentially predict how similar the fauna is likely to be between mountain A and mountain B based on the elevation at which they are best connected. Which is a really interesting principle that seems to apply across, well, basically all taxa that can't fly. Although snakes are also, snakes are very good dispersers. So another question, what is typically needed for describing such a species? I'm not from the crustacean background, we have our Soft to look into. Well, we leave our animals in one piece for the most part, which is quite different from a lot of the so many legs. <laughs> yes, exactly. We only have the four legs, we like to keep them on the body, although uh, some people do cut them off for various reasons. Um, no, so, so 
there are a few problems associated with this. If you're collecting um, or, or doing research in Madagascar, for vertebrates, you're typically limited to two specimens per species per site. Site is slightly vaguely defined, but still you wind up with basically very, very small numbers of specimens. Especially if you can only find the species at one site, you can only get two of them. That's the and regulation. That's the regulation. Those are the, those are the permit rules. And 50% of all the specimens you collect must stay in Madagascar. So now I have one frog. So a lot of our species are described based on one specimen. It's either that or going back to the same location on repeated permits to slowly build one by one individual things. We think that that is an unsustainable model and it also doesn't make any sense when at the same time the same ministry is turning to mining agencies and saying, yes, absolutely, no problem, you made it for us all of this area. Um, it's a bit silly to regulate the scientific research that way and then let the, the deforestation kind of continue unabated. But yeah, so often we're based on very, very small series. Um, and those series then are, uh, yeah, they're, they're precious. When possible for the frogs, we try to, um, we collect calls of the individual while it's calling. We try to photograph it while it's calling, which is bloody difficult. And then we try to catch the one that's been calling. And if you fail to catch it, that's two hours wasted. And uh, then you have that one individual, you take that one with you if you possibly can. You leave the other one behind, whatever it was. And so we have that one call voucher and we try to describe our species based on call vouchers. It's yeah, it's quite hard to get calls, especially because a lot of our species we encounter um, just spontaneously. And they'll just be hopping around on the forest floor and facing chameleons very slowly crawling through the forest floor. And we just happen to find them. Um, and then you don't have the opportunity to like, take the best specimen. You take the specimen that you've got. Um, and then the taxonomic process is fairly simple. Um, what we developed for the the monograph in which we described those 26 species was a very simple, extremely repetitious uh, description style where basically every description has the same content. You just change the words that are relevant for the individual. Um, and the diagnosis is not focused on giving a diagnosis, a diagnosis against all 46 other species, but it's really focused on the ones that look the most similar because all the other ones are just been sitting. So um, it's a very straightforward process. If you have a clearly describable species and a decent knowledge of the literature and the other species, you could write one of these papers in three days. That's some barcoding, I guess. Obviously, yes, you, you do need the genetics. It's, it's very rare that species like this would be uh, obvious enough to describe without having genetic data. So we use genetics in basically everything. Thank you.